welcome to Inspired Women Amazing Lives Podcast, where we seek to thrive, flourish, and celebrate amazing women. Kimberly Wiggins here, and we are hosting inspired women who are sharing their lives and stories so that other women may know that the journey to your amazing life is definitely within reach. We are here every week to share resources and information that will help you along the journey to being that inspired woman leading an amazing life. Remember to like and comment and most definitely share these episodes with another woman that you admire and who, one who truly inspires you. Or simply share with someone you would like to inspire. Enjoy. Welcome to Inspired Women Amazing Lives podcast. And my guest today is Miss Maylene Benson. Welcome, Maylene. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Yes, and just so you will know exactly who she is, she is quite, quite impressive. Um, Maylene is a coach, basically. She helps authors. She's an online business and self-publishing coach. And so she helps authors, potential authors, and business owners and experts and speakers and coaches and consultants to launch their signature books and their online courses. And that, go ahead, Maylene. No, that's correct. I'm just confirming. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no problem at all. Yes. And so we're really excited to have her on the show today because we have not. This is our first time having someone specifically talk about course creation and book publishing. So we're going to get a lot of information out of this uh, show today because it'll tell you exactly how to create your, um, how to publish your book and how to create your courses. So, Maylene, I want to start by just you giving us some of your story. Some, what brought you to this point? I've heard this story before. You're going to love this, audience. This is quite interesting. Go ahead, Maylene. Well, uh, I'm not 25 anymore, so my story is really long. I started in, uh, in accounting. I knew from the very beginning I was not going to be an accountant, but I had my family very early on, so I stayed for a while, and I had the chance to work with a lot of entrepreneurs while I was an accountant. So there was something to it anyway. I was trying to kind of sneak in other tasks, task, other things I could help them with. Then in the mid-90s, there was this whole wave of teaching a computer. So I got a job uh, during nighttime teaching IT, uh, Word, Excel, how to not press enter at the end of the line on the computer. <laughs> so we're back in the days now. It was super fun and I discovered that I love teaching. Uh, but at some point I ended up in a position that was a lot of administration and there wasn't really room for my creativity there. So I started studying marketing and at some point I got a job as an innovator at an insurance company. And after seven years in that company, I was doing innovation projects, strategy, and I had an awesome corporate career. I ended up uh, at the second highest level of this uh, one, a, a big insurance company. It's number one in, uh, in Denmark, number two in Norway. So I should be happy about this career. The only problem was that I wasn't. <laughs> I got my MBA, I got this fancy job, I got the salary, and I wasn't happy. So at some point, I, after kind of diving in and figuring out why am I not happy, I discovered that it had to do both with my job, but also with my personal life. So I ended up selling everything I have, get divorced, uh, and kind of pack my bag and go to Latin America. <laughs> I love dancing Cuban salsa, so I was hoping that maybe I could learn some more salsa there. Um, but what happened was that 
after just a few weeks, well, at that point, if I'm backing up a little, at that point, I really wanted to start a company. And I've been traveling a lot while trying to figure out what to do next. And I discovered that the only thing I really wanted to do was traveling. So I had to find some way of earning money while traveling. And that's the true reason why I just bought a plane ticket and decided I'm now an independent. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to build a company, support myself without any employer. And I had no idea what I was doing. So <laughs> I, uh, after a few weeks in Lima, Peru, I happened to meet a guy that had a small startup company there and they were converting books into eBooks. So while I was trying to figure out how to create a scalable online business, this guy showed me the whole world of books and he asked me to help him create a proposal for a big Danish company to do an investment in his small startup company in Lima, Peru of all places. And they said yes, and they said yes on that condition that I stayed. So for that reason, I kind of bumped into the whole book world. But the really fun part of this, Kimberly, is that when I was eight years old, in my dad's and my mom's house, I created a small library. And I created courses to teach all of the children on my, in my street how to create books. <laughs> and I was sitting there week after week, waiting for them to come to my house to borrow books because they must love books as much as me. <laughs> so it was kind of a full circle. <laughs> yes. Wow, Millie, that's, that's awesome. And now there's quite a bit of nuggets in there. I like to point out nuggets to my audience because the greatest nugget in there is Millie coming full circle. It is truly, that has always been inside of her. You know, yes. it's, it's always been your passion, really, because yes. you were doing it when you were a child. The thing was, the thing is, I think, is that you're not able to, to kind of see the signs until you're ready for them. And yes. you're not, uh, I, I, in, in hindsight, now I know why I needed to go to Latin America. I needed to escape my kind of my own regular world to be able to even think and feel what I wanted. Uh, so nice. I was so wrapped up in the norms and uh, all, of, uh, all of what I was thinking about what I should want to do. I thought I should want a career. It was just a matter of figuring out which corporate career. Uh, and, and I couldn't even hear my own heart telling me that I need bare feet in the grass. I need my coupon salsa. I need my creativity. I need to be the crazy Malina sometimes. Yes. <laughs> and I needed some more color in my life than an insurance company uh, or an accounting company. So <laughs> even though I love the math, I love finances, I love the numbers, uh, but I need that other side of it as well. And I wasn't able to see that until I kind of escaped my own world and exposed myself to a completely different way of looking at things. That's really nice, Maylene. Um, and, and, and when it comes to the accounting part of it, I can really relate because that's how I started out. Um, really? <laughs> I went to college and, you know, I learned accounting in high school and I was so excited about it. And I so loved my accounting teacher that I really thought, Oh, this is what I'm going to do. So I went to college and got my degree in accounting and loved it. And then when I got in, the co in corporate America, I was like, yeah. I was in there less than a year and I was like, oh, I don't love this anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> I totally, but I knew I had to do it because I'd already invested all that time and money. But like you, I was looking for the next thing out. Now, what's different is that you really decided i'm 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 suffering here i i'm i, I don't like this so i'm going to change it all i mean you moved you got a divorce you oh my gosh you just really changed things up and yeah. it worked great yeah. well you could say obviously a divorce is not from one day to another so right. it was something that happened also over time and I had this quite unique opportunity that 
I uh, was able to quit my job at that point in time financially. I was also recently divorced. I had to move out of my apartment anyways. And all of my three children were grown-ups and they were living with their boyfriends and girlfriends. And I knew it was just a matter of time before I would have grandchildren. So it was now or never. And I recently got my first grandchild. So it was a good wow. thing that I acted on my impulse. <laughs> That is really, really nice. That's a great, great story. Um, and, and women in the audience, I do want you to hear that Maylene had to trust her heart. You know, she had to say, it's now or never. And she had to trust that. And she put some things in place. Like she said, it was a good time financially. She had this offer, you know. So it wasn't like she just made the leap. She did plan it well. Um, but she knew it was time. But I was, I tell you, I was kind of scared also because I, my yeah. first trip wasn't to Peru. First, I actually it went to Argentina for five weeks, wow. traveling alone. And I didn't know a single word of Spanish. Uh, if you're not from Spain and Europe, you yeah. wouldn't speak Spanish. <laughs> right. So, so I didn't know a single word. I was traveling alone for a longer period of time for the first time in my life. And in South America, where I didn't understand every, anything, uh, I tried a lot of things that I'd been scared of doing before, uh, like also physical stuff. <laughs> um, but um, when, I, when I sat there in the airplane going back home, I remember sitting next to a lady and she was crying her eyes out. She was about my age and she was crying the whole way. That's like 10 hours wow. uh, during the flight. She was crying all the way. And I w had this very deep sense that she had left something that she really didn't want to leave. Uh, and I was thinking, I need to feel that. And it was this weirdest feeling that I want to feel life more. I want to do that. So, and I know I, I've experienced that in America now for five weeks. I knew I wanted to build some kind of business that had to do with that. Uh, so I had a few problems. I didn't have a network. I had no idea how to do business in Latin America and I didn't speak Spanish. So I kind of had to make it a five year plan. So the first thing I did was to start those Cuban salsa lessons. And the next thing I did was to go through my network. Who would know anything about Latin America? Who do I know who can tell me more? So this is about kind of leaning forward and exposing yourself to something that you, you, know, you find it interesting, you have no idea where it's going to go. And I felt that so strongly that I would have to accept uh, and I even, I made sure I told uh, all of my friends and even my family that I'm going to be in a completely different place in five years. Right now, I have no idea where that's going to be, but it's going to take me five years to get there. And that really helped me apply kind of a learning approach to everything so that, that I always take imperfect action and lean forward instead of kind of Use, using all of my strength to keep, to keep standing upright, I kind of want to lean forward. <laughs> yeah. So it, I, I learned that from these travelings as well. But I kind of, as I mentioned, I needed to kind of cut cut my anchors first, <laughs> and wow. and kind of stay in my own context to be able to even feel that. But there are many ways of doing that. Approaching starting a business is an excellent way of doing that. It kind of have that approach that I'm, I'm going to learn it. It's going to take a while. I'm never going to be done learning, but I'm going to lean forward. Um, yeah, I think that's super important as an entrepreneur. Yes. Thank you for that, Maylene. Yes. Um, just to hear some of your mindset behind all of that, because it does take a strong mindset to do that. And also just being able to, incorporate that mindset into who you are so as you are continuing to walk out that five-year plan you had a concept in your mind of i am going to lean into things i'm going to lead forward um yes. i love that i love it love it love it awesome awesome story um now you're in this book publishing world 
right? Yes. yes. And first of all, the first thing I want to know, because this is so juicy for me, and, and let me tell you, Maylene, why, because I am in the process of getting a book ready for publishing, and I am writing another book already. Wow. So, so um, my first book was kind of like a passion project. And now the second book really relates to actually what I, I do as a, as a coach. So um, in this book publishing world, tell me, or just so my audience will know, what do you see a book doing for a business? What, what, what is the importance of a business owner or a business publishing a book? Well, the first thing I want to say is that quite often, we, without even realizing, we kind of adopt the mindset of a fiction author. When we talk about book publishing, quite often what we hear is very successful fiction novelists. Uh, so publishing fictional books. And it's a completely different game when you're publishing non-fiction to boost your business. And I'm gonna tell you why, because when you're doing fiction, you kind of have to play with the words and do, use your imagination to create something new. The, the whole process, you have to be very creative, inventing your characters, describing the places so that I can kind of feel that I'm also there, or it could have been me there. Uh, but when you're doing nonfiction, you already have all of the knowledge. Mm -hmm. All of what you want to convey is already in your head. So for any coach, consultant, teacher, speaker, any kind of expert, they are already they have their their knowledge highly organized. And they are already communicating that knowledge in different ways, in a product, an online course, in um, a group coaching. They kind of have their systems, they have the processes and their knowledge in place already. So uh, creating a book for them shouldn't be about being creative. That's for the book designer, a book artist. <laughs> they got, they're going to make it beautiful, but the actual words you want to convey, that shouldn't be a super creative process. Um, so, uh, did I answer your questions? <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so I think it's it's important that you kind of separate uh, the, those two categories. So what's happening in the publishing world is that the traditional publishers they are more and more also focusing on on digital books, on audio books but they're still far behind and their, uh, their time span for how they plan what they're going to publish is about two years. So if you present a book proposal to a traditional publisher, if they don't have that topic of a book already inside of their plan, they are not even going to read your script. It's quite rare that they would even spend time considering if it's a great topic because it's not in their marketing plan for the next two years. They're actually publishing quite a few books. And because they, ha they have a process where they are printing high volumes, they're distributing physical books, and they do that to keep the cost down and their margins up, uh, they have a higher risk. So they would be publishing with a traditional publisher will be a very long process because they really feel the need to invest a lot of resources and time to make sure it has each book has to become a market success. And even though we also as self-publishers want a market success, we can do it a lot faster. And we can do it for a small niche, which a traditional publisher cannot do because they need, uh, they are investing in a few books and they need broader appeal uh, to these books. So they need broader markets this quite often means that when you're publishing with a traditional publisher and they're professional, they are super professional, uh, their professional team for creating the book, they are kind of will most likely draw you in a di direction where your book will become for a broader market. And as an expert in a niche, you don't have that interest. You want to make it very, very specific for your ideal client. 
why wouldn't you want to sell a lot of books as well? Obviously, but nobody is, to be honest, nobody is actually making a lot of money from books, especially not nonfiction books. So the book's role in your business is to give that instant authority and to become a lead generator. So Amazon, for example, is one of the biggest search engines that we have. And mm -hmm. everybody logging into the Amazon website or entering into the Amazon website, they have their credit card ready. And when they're typing something in the search bar, it's because they're looking and they're ready to invest in finding an answer. So you can be present there when millions of people are looking for an answer to the problem that you can solve. But in order to compete in that market, you want to be very specific about which problem you're solving. So the exact same strategies that you would apply to your general marketing, you should apply when you are uh, specifying the topic of your book. You want to make sure that it attracts your ideal client. Then what we will do is that we create a link from the book to your sales funnels online. So usually when you're selling books online or offline, you wouldn't know who is buying your book. You don't, Amazon has a lot of data. They're using, it's a data-based business. They have tons of data, but as an author, you will not get access to any of that data. Even less if it's a physical books and physical bookstores but we can create a link between your book and your sales funnel by making it very specific for your ideal client, the probability of them going to your website for something, some additional content that will kind of supplement or make them get to their solution faster. They, would, they are very likely to kind of enter your funnel. So the lead you would get from your book they are highly qualified and very valuable leads. Absolutely. Now, Maylene, thank you so much. You gave me so much information there. Um, you answered my question. You answered that question plus the other question for me, which was the main difference between self-publishing mm -hmm. and traditional publishing. And you made really good points about that. Um, so you talked about... I'm sorry, there is one more point I would like to make about that. And that is about the commercial rights. <coughs> so when you're publishing with a traditional publisher, you're giving up rights to your book. So the first advice is to read the contract. <laughs> also, the, one, the, the lines with the small letters. <laughs> so if you give up the commercial rights for your book, when the publishing house, they, maybe they have sold a thousand copies. Let's say they sold a thousand copies. They don't think that they can sell a thousand more. So they will take it off the market. If you published like that, you wouldn't be able to put it on the market because you gave away the book rights. So an important thing about publishing as an, specifically as an entrepreneur, you want to be able to make the decisions inside of your business. Also when it comes to your book when it comes to how, what it should look like, which niche it should be targeting, what the message should be, but also for how long and how it should be marketed. Mm -hmm. So apart from the process being super long, apart from you being kind of overruled sometimes by a, a highly skilled, very skilled a professional book editing team, for example, you might be overruled in the process. So it's also the creative rights, really. But... Above all, if there's one takeaway from this is that you keep your commercial rights to your book. So you can keep launching it for however long you like. You know, that's a good point that you made, uh, Maylene. I recently um, spoke with, she, she was not a podcast guest. I spoke with um, a client, a potential client. Um, I was talking to her on the phone and she had written um, one of the, she had written a chicken soup for the soul type mm -hmm. in one of the chicken soup for the soul series. She was an author in there a long time ago and she'd done it about productivity. 
And so um, one of the things that she stated in there was that she has not made any money off that book for a very long time. And productivity was her niche. Mm -hmm. um, because of the book she wrote with the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, she was banned in her contract, contractually banned from writing another productivity book. She oh. couldn't, yeah, she couldn't, she had used her like signature system in that book and she was banned yeah. from using it in another book anywhere else. So yeah. she was, her and I were having conversations so we could brainstorm ideas about things she could do other books she could write to circumvent that or go around that in some other topic that was still related to productivity. Um, yeah, and, and this can happen even if even if the publisher do not want to do anything with that book anymore. Yes, and there, this can happen. Really, yeah, they were really selling. She's like, I'm not making any money off that book at all because they're not really. It's old. It was that book was 20 years old. I think she said it was. Oh my goodness. Yeah, oh, goodness. so it was kind of. I was kind of sad about that because she had done um, some interviews. She did an interview on Oprah. She did an interview somewhere else. She told me she did an interview. But she couldn't really, I said, these are things you should be able to leverage. Um, yeah. But she couldn't figure out how to leverage them because she felt she was pigeonholed into this contract where she couldn't write another book. So. I hear th I hear this so often, and 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 I f I believe that if you write a novel, I think a book can have a bigger push through a traditional publisher. I I have a lot of books will be having a bigger push through a traditional publisher, but if you run a business, I really think you should think twice about not self publishing. You you would probably want to self publish. You have so much more control and, and you definitely own all of the rights. Yeah. Uh, and, and even though I say that, that you don't earn a lot of money, very few people, they don't make, most people don't make a lot of money on their book, but they make them on the back and sell if you, if you do it right. If you do it right, it can be a, an excellent boost for your business. But, but the, the revenue will come in on your back end uh, of, of your more important, more profitable product or service. Yeah, even my passion project book here that I'm getting out, um, it, it is a, more of a spiritual book. Mm -hmm. um, and even in that project, I am not, I'm not just putting the book out there and not um, I'm going to self-publish, but I'm not just putting the book out there without a plan for it on the back end. Because like you said, you know, everything I've read said the yes. same thing. Um, you know, there is not a lot of money to be made from the book itself, but um, the back end. It's and a great lead generator and it's a really good... It's a really good uh, authority builder as well. Yes. Almost, almost on any topic. Obviously, the closer it is to what you want to be known for, the stronger the brand uh, impact it will have. But even if you publish a children's book, people yes. just simply admire people who published. I read a survey that 81%, it's an old survey, but 81% of all Americans feel they have a book inside that they want to publish, that they should publish it. And less than 1% do. So every time you stand in front of a person, there's a pretty big chance that they would love to be in your shoes. <laughs> yes. And it's how we have books is how we have a kind of packaged knowledge and education for centuries. So instantly, we, we consider a, an author an, an authority almost, almost no matter what the topic is. But for sure, it is a huge lead generator as well if, if there's a really close match. But in any case, whatever you publish, people, people admire that. 
Especially yeah. if they create content themselves, they would know how much it takes to create content. But I have a workaround to make that faster, that process for a hoop. Do you want to oh, know? <laughs> yeah, very nice. The thing is, when I, when, uh, I started, uh, I told about the difference between a fiction book and a nonfiction book. So for the nonfiction book, uh, which is, that's a segment I work in, and my process is developed for that specifically. The knowledge is already organized. So it's about kind of doing a brain dump and, and remember all of your knowledge. So I have a process for kind of opening up all of those small pockets uh, inside of your brain to kind of have that uh, visible knowledge outside of your brain, organizing a structure, and then we speak the book. So instead of typing it, we speak it, we transcribe it, and then we edit. And when you do this process right, it's all in the preparation. What we actually do is that when we do it this way is that we separate the task of the left side of the brain and the task of the right side of the brain. Let me explain that. The left side of the brain, I'm making it, I'm simplifying it, but the left side of the brain is it likes to make decisions and work with sequences. So it wants to put everything in an order. Whereas the right side of the brain is the creative part. It's, a, it's where you develop ideas. So if you write traditionally, you open up a document and you start typing, then your left side of the brain will be constructing sequences of words, that's sentences, Whereas in the same time, the right side of the brain will get an idea and think about what should come in the side of the book. Where is this going? It's developing a new thinking about your topic even. And it's going to stop the left side of the brain and say, hey, I have this idea. Left side of the brain will say, okay, let me check in which, where in the sequence I'm going to put this. And this is why you... You can do that, the first page, second page, maybe even 10 or 15 pages. But when you get to 50 pages, this is when people enter writer's block. Because you don't have clear where your book is going. And this happens even when people created an outline first. Yes. So, so when, what we do is we separate. I facilitate a process where you make all of those decisions and where you recall all of your great ideas before you start constructing sentences. Mm. And, and then, so this is kind of separating the two processes so they, they are not interfering with each other. When we start speaking instead of typing, that's, both, that's for several reasons. The first one is that when you speak, you tend to get a better, you get closer to your own voice. It, it sounds uh, logical, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, when you speak, you are more your own voice. For some weird reason, when we start writing, we sound a little bit weird and formal and um, not necessarily ourselves. Yes. It becomes more you. And what you want with your book is to build, not only to convey a, a message and transfer knowledge or a system to someone, you also want to build a relationship with your reader. They right. need to be able to feel you so you feel a connection and a trust that you can help them if you want them to enter your funnel that's an uh, uh, that's a goal we have also for your book mm -hmm. and the other reason why we do audio instead of typing is that you are able to type at least oh sorry to speak at least 10 times faster than you can even type even mm -hmm. if you type fast so if you just think about you can probably read a nonfiction book of 200 pages. You can easily read that during a weekend. Mm -hmm. So when you're reading, that's the same as speaking. It's an internal dialogue you have when you're reading. So that's about the speed that you can create a 200 page book, but not if you're typing it. You, we all, I think we can all agree that none of us would be able to type 200 pages of a book in a weekend. Uh, so this is the, the second reason why we are using audio instead is that it's simply faster and that we want to type it is just an expression of old technology <laughs> that we kind of didn't uh, adapt to and, and um, 
and use new technology, which is recording audio and transcribing audio. And there are tools that can do that. Within a few hours, you can transcribe a few hundred pages. So what we can actually do using this method is to go from blank page to a complete first round edited book. I call it a first full draft because it's all there, but you can still improve it if you want in maybe three weeks. So we can publish a book within a few months instead of spending a year. And as a business owner and an entrepreneur, I think that if we think logically about it, all of those nonfiction books that we see having a huge success, these people, they didn't take a year out of their, <laughs> of their schedule to write it. They no. did something smarter. And we can copy that and do something smarter when we are creating our own books. I agree, um, Maylene. I did not... Um, I, your process is really, 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 really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I had kind of tapped into some of that by chance. Mm -hmm. Um, on this book that I'm writing, th that I'm finishing up now, because I was, I was moving around so much and I didn't have time to write. So I would just use my, I used Evernote and my phone and I would record it. Yes. And it was real easy because I was only recording one devotional page at a time. So it was easy to do it that way. Yeah. Um, but now that you mention it with my regular book, um, I'd have to, I definitely, I'm definitely interested in your process to figure out how to do that um, yeah. with a regular book, you know? I usually say that you should apply the Pareto rule. So when we do it like this, it's not going to be perfect, but it can come quite close to perfect. But we, we kind of accept uh, it's, it's also about leaning forward and doing it anyway. <laughs> it's yeah. a general principle that I apply. It's a parade rule. I'm going to lean forward. I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to accept, I'm going to do it a little bit faster and um, spending 20% of the time getting the book 80% done, but 80% done in the way that it's complete. There's a beginning, there's a middle and there's the end. And I made all of the decision on what goes in there before I even start recording my audio. So this means that from that point in time, at any point in time, I can decide now it's done. If you start from one end and you get to page 120, if you didn't write the end yet, it cannot be done. You cannot decide to publish it. But when we do it like this, it's, it's done, but maybe it's not perfect and maybe you want to improve it and you can then keep improving it until you find that it's perfect now and I'm going to publish it now. But it has, uh, it's complete very early in the process. Um, I, like I think that's that. super important because we, we, can, we can keep thinking about what should go inside of the book. Mm -hmm. But the, the prequisition for this process working is that the first few steps you do all of the work up front. So when it's a nonfiction book, you have a very clear idea on your ideal client and what, what is the problem you're solving in the book and what's, what, how is it that you are solving this problem? So that, that's where I usually say to my clients, don't think that publishing a book is about spending 80% of the time actually writing the book. You spend quite some time making sure and some of, of your listeners or viewers will for sure already have that just nailed very clearly inside of their business. But that's why we want to spend some time to make sure we know who's the ideal client, who's the book for, what is the problem the book is solving, what is the solution that we're solving it with uh, to, or to, this, to this problem. And then we spend maybe 20% of the time actually uh, outlining the book, speaking the book, and then we spend actually half of the time on design because we want our book. It's a branding book. It's a, a brand building book. It's meant to boost our personal brand. So we want it to be beautiful, but we don't need to know how to do this ourselves as entrepreneurs. You can find people to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So totally just agree. right there, half of the process outsourced, and then you just uh, spend your time of developing your business concepts really. And the actual manuscript creation it's just a fraction of the time you're going to use on publishing a book. 
Wow. I, oh my gosh, Maylene, you have, we've, we're running out of time. You've given us so much information today. Um, that's audience. If you have, if you're thinking about writing a book and you are put off like I was, um, Maylene, I have about, I want to say I have about eight books that I have started writing mm -hmm. and not finished. Exactly. Because I get to that point where I'm, I'm out of steam. Like I have writer's block. And then I, just like you talked about, I mean, I'm trying to do it in that linear fashion where I'm starting exactly. it and just trying to finish it up. So yeah. I'm sure there's people in my audience just like me today who um, have books in their head or books they've started writing. Check out Maylene's process. This process sounds like something that makes it so much easier. Um, I, that's why I did this passion project first, because I wanted to cut my teeth on something that was not so structured mm -hmm. um, in a way where I would feel like, oh, I've got to start this from the beginning and take it all the way out to the end in this fashion. I thought, okay, my devotional, which I've always wanted to do, um, I said, this could be what I cut my teeth on because I'm just doing one page a day and it's unrelated to the rest of the book. Yeah. <laughs> so it made it, it, it's really not as related to what you did in the previous chapter or anything else, you know? I said, yeah. it's, it's kind of, it's something I could do one page a day and I'm good with that. And so check out um, Maylene's process if you are thinking about doing a book and Maylene's uh, website, and it will be on my podcast page, just like it sounds, MaylenBedson.com. And so, um, and it'll be on my podcast page. Maylene, I so appreciate you coming out today. And thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yes, and she's giving a free gift today, which is her free masterclass um, and a PDF infographic with her top five tips to self-publishing. So yes. you want to grab that if you are thinking about a book. Um, now, before we wrap up today, Maylene, I want you to give my audience one tip, one amazing tip that they can put into use today for that book publishing project? Well, it, 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 my uh, advice number one is also always the applying the Pareto rule to everything you do inside of your business. Nobody will know what that last 20% is that made it perfect in your eyes. It's better to get something out there. So the great thing about self-publishing is also that it does not have to be perfect. It can appear perfect and you might feel it's not, but even if it wasn't, you can kind of easily take, it's just a file that you upload. So you can take that down, do some corrections and upload it again. So just do it. <laughs> just do it. If you've been thinking about it, come join us in our program and we will definitely be able to show you how you can do this a lot faster. Apply the Pareto rule, spend 20% of the time getting 80% done. Be smarter. Yes. Be smarter. Oh. I so love that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been wonderful. Um, tons of information. Hopefully this has inspired women to really get out there and use this. Um, this as another tool in your business. And that's what I'm using it for, Maylene. It is a tool for my business, um, branding and marketing for my business. So I appreciate it so much. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, thank you are so welcome. And thank you, audience, for being here today. I appreciate it. And we are wrapping up this episode of Inspired Women, Amazing Lives. And make sure that you like, comment, and share this episode with someone who needs it. And we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Inspired Women, Amazing Lives Podcast. 
where we help women to be truly inspired to live their most amazing lives. Please subscribe to the podcast to be notified of new content every single week. Feel free to like, comment, and share with the woman who inspires you the most. I hope to see you on the next episode. Goodbye. Safety and the whisper of my secrets Pouring out onto the surface Hold me under the exposure